And good afternoon. My name is Mark Prach. I'm the vice chair of the um, Rotocraft Specialist Group. Uh, welcome to today's um, webinar. And best wishes to you all in these um, difficult times. During my career, firstly in, in the RAF, we trained for NBC operations. But the nearest we got to uh, putting that in, into practice with was the first Gulf War, where we expected Saddam Hussein to um, release agents. But of course, that didn't come to pass. Later on, when I worked for the Bristow Group, I, I was involved in the planning of the H1N1 flu uh, pandemic. And in conjunction with uh, UK Oil and Gas, the DFT and DEC, we ha had to plan how to keep key oil and gas platforms running. But again, we didn't have, have to put that into practice. This time around with um, COVID-19, people have had to react very quickly. We appreciate that everybody's doing a great job, but we thought that now would be a good time to take stock, compare notes, and see if we could learn from each other. Before we start, I have a few housekeeping announcements to make. Today's um, webinar is being um, videoed and audio um, recorded. These files will be shared with all attendees in, in a couple of days through an e email which can be accessed free of charge. You will also um, receive a certificate of attendance for um, CPD uh, alongside the um, video. We invite your comments and questions you'll find a questions tab in the GoToWebinar um, platform on your screen. If you have, have questions during the um, presentations, please feel free to submit them via the questions box, and we'll answer as many as we can at the end of the um, webinar. But we might not be able to answer all the questions due to time. If your question is directed at a particular speaker, please indicate to who that the question is directed. Otherwise, we'll just answer the questions on a case-by-case -case, uh, basis. All attendees are automatically uh, muted. So if you wish to um, communicate, please go uh, do so via the questions tab on the um, platform box on your screen. When we get to the Q&A set session, please um, remember that Chatham House rules apply. That is to say, the information may be freely used, but the source may not be um, quoted. We don't want um, people quoted on um, Facebook, um, LinkedIn, or um, whatever. Right, let's out outline the speakers today. Firstly, we'll start off with uh, three that'll talk mainly about the onshore side. We'll start with um, Wing Commander Elizabeth um, Gilbertson, who amongst other roles, she's the Chief Air Engineer for the Puma 2 um, uh, the Delivery Duty Holder, is the MA Continued Air Worthiness Manager for the Puma 2, and has been appointed lead aviation engineer for the aviation task force and um, COVID support. We'll then move on to Sam Schwab, who is a HEM specialist working for um, Leonardo Helicopters. Sam has worked for them since May last year. Before that, he spent um, 14 years as a flight nurse and um, during uh, that time, he, he was um, a um, the director of clinical op operations. He, his background is in emergency me medicine, uh, um, adult and, and su um, surgical ICU. Once we've heard from Sam, we'll then move on to Stefan Bessel from Airbus. Sam comes uh, from an engineering background, but has worked on, on SAR he helicopter squ squadrons and through uh, most of the, um, the Airbus fleet. Following the onshore side, we'll then move on to three speakers from the um, Coast Guards, starting with uh, Captain Clark Broad, 
who's the flight op operations ma manager for Bristow. Uh, Bristow provide the SAR for the U uh, UK um, Coast Guard. And I hope as well as from the, the uh, Coast Guard side, we'll hear from Clark about the oil and gas um, um, patient transport, which um, we uh, know has occurred. Following Clark, we'll then hear from uh, David Ward, who's the Chief um, Crewman Me Medical Standards for CHC Ireland. CHC Ireland provide the SAR service for the Irish uh, Coast Guard. And, and as well as the SAR role, um, CHC Ireland also does a lot of HEMS um, ta uh, tasking. So we should hear, hear from David about that as well. The third speaker we have is John er Erlinson from the Icelandic Coast Guard. Um, John joined the Icelandic Coast Guard in uh, 1997. Uh, for um, many years, he, he was a chief ho hoist op op operator before um, moving on. And the current role he has is to um, project manage the upcoming um, uh, the tender to re replace their uh, current SAR fleet of two e EC-225s and one AS-332L1. And it, it'll be in interesting to hear from John because I, I know the Icelandic uh, Coast Guard have been um, using an isolation um, stretcher as well. The final speaker is An Andrew Dutch from um, 1710 Na Naval Air uh, Squadron. Uh, and Andy joined the Navy in um, 79, uh, correction, um, 78 as an aircraft um, um, mechanic. In um, 92, he, he took on the role of the Navy's SME for aircraft coating. In 2000, he, he left the um, Navy but transferred to the um, um, civil service in, in a similar role. Of great interest to us, I think, is that Andy's been involved in aircraft in affection control support in the past for both um, foot and mouth and in 2013 and 2014 for the Ebola um, crisis. Right, so those are the speakers we should hear from. And please feel feel free to um, put in your, your uh, questions. So let's start off with the first one. Um, Wing Commander Elizabeth um, Gilbertson. Thank you, Mark, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm going to talk to you today about Operation Rescript um, and the UK military response to Operation Rescript. Rescript. Operation Rescript is um, the military support to the UK uh, response to COVID-19. We have established the COVID support force and I'm going to talk specifically about the aviation task force element. Um, we'll start with the requirement, what we've been asked to do, then the response and how we have responded to that, before looking at some of the challenges that we've faced along the way so far and then the lessons that we're starting to draw out. I stress, though, that this is an ongoing operation. Um, we remain at very high readiness dispersed across the UK, and so these lessons will develop over time. Next, please. So first, the requirement. The UK Armed Forces are charged with 25 defence tasks, one of which is to provide support to the civil contingency operations in the form of military aid to the civil authority. We're asked to provide specialist skills, we're asked to meet um, a lack of capacity, um, and we're asked to meet capabilities that may not be available for a variety of reasons within the civil sector. For Operation Rescript, the armed forces have been asked to provide against all three of these areas, but specifically for the rotary lift, we were asked to provide a UK-wide capability to allow the carriage of critically ill patients medics and supplies, but also some specialist personnel operating in dense urban environments, but also within remote rural locations. And critically, it needed to be scalable. The UK, as everyone I'm sure knows, has been planning against the worst credible position. We needed to be able to surge to meet that worst credible position. 
um, and we have put measures in place. But critically, we had to maintain the UK's military commitments overseas. So much of what I'm talking about here has also been used on operations in Africa, uh, the Middle East, and a variety of other locations that have been ongoing. Next slide, please. When we look at the response, the UK's military response has been led by the Headquarters Standing Joint Command, and the COVID Support Force Aviation Task Force was tasked to the Joint Helicopter Command. We've drawn on a, a wide variety of assets from across the Joint Helicopter Command, or, although you'll notice Apache isn't listed. Um, and starting in the top right-hand side, we've had the Royal Air Force Chinook, the Royal Air Force Puma, moving across to the Army's Wildcat and the Royal Navy uh, Merlin. But I want to draw your attention to the two force enablers that sit in the middle with the two um, crests. The first being the Joint Helicopter Support Squadron. This unit established helicopter landing sites for us. So operating in those dense urban environments, but also in some of the rural environments, we've absolutely drawn on their skill set. And Tactical Supply Wing are a force multiplier for Joint Helicopter Command. They establish remote refueling sites for us. And given the downturn in general aviation activity over the last few weeks, and the closure of some of those remote airfields where we might normally source fuel, uh, their support has been critical. Next slide, please. To establish the pan-UK coverage, we have deployed assets north. Most of the Joint Helicopter Command assets are normally based in the south of England. And so we've had to deploy assets into Scotland and into um, north, the north of England. So Puma has deployed to our Kinloss Barracks along with uh, Tactical Supply Wing and Joint Helicopter Support elements. RAF Leeming played host to the Army Wildcat first uh, deployment, with RAF Benson hosting the Aviation Task Force headquarters. It's also the home base for the um, Puma helicopters and provided resilient support into Kinloss. The RAF Chinook, the second echelon of the Army Wildcat support, and the Merlin were based from their home bases at RAF Odeon, Royal uh, Naval Air Station Yeovilton, and Cold Rose, um, respectively. And you can see from the map the coverage that we have achieved. So those are the range circles of each of the platforms from their base location. What I should stress, though, is it doesn't reflect what we can achieve with the refuelling operations um, provided from commercial outlets, but all from, also from tactical supply wing. So we have been able to cover Northern Ireland and the outer islands of both Scotland and England. Next slide, please. Looking at the response and the challenges that we have faced, um, the UK, so the armed forces, as Mark alluded to, are used to training for contaminated environments, but they're normally training for nuclear or biological contaminants in a war zone scenario. The difference here is the viral situation um, prevalent across the community with our, our teams going home, in some cases, to their families every evening. So we had to understand the COVID environment. We had to put measures in place to decontaminate aircraft and equipment um, that has been used by our personnel, not just after the carriage of a COVID person, but also as a preventative measure to stop any virus infection spreading amongst our team. We had to understand what the PPE requirements were, partly for those crews who are operating and carrying COVID um, suspected contaminated people, but also for our teams working in close proximity to each other, decontaminating the aircraft and using some, some fairly robust chemicals, um, and also how we could undertake aircraft maintenance. Operating within the military maintenance organisation where we don't use licensed engineers, uh, supervision and close working is a key tenant of, our, of maintaining airworthiness. We've had to put measures in place to allow that to happen to allow people to work within the two metre bubble and to do that safely. And that leads me on to risk management. Risk management has been at the heart of this. It's, it's at the heart of every operation that we undertake. But understanding um, what our risks are, what the new risks are with crews operating in novel environments, 
um, undertaking activities that we wouldn't normally um, expose them to. Um, the balancing the risk to life challenges of people wearing the appropriate equipment to protect them from a COVID infection, but also wearing the appropriate aircraft survival equipment to pr protect them in the case of an aircraft emergency. We've had to make sure that the appropriate risk owners are satisfied that we are as low as reasonably practical in all situations and that when a LARP is achieved, that we are in a tolerable situation. And that has been something that we have been working on constantly. We've also had to look at our equipment requirements. We have had to carry a significant amount of emergency medical equipment on our aircraft, none of which was cleared for use on our aircraft. Communications equipment has had to be increased to allow us to operate effectively with the civil authority and safety equipment has been introduced to allow us um, to, to operate in novel environments. The Release to Service Authority for all arms of the military have been working closely with our defence equipment and support teams to enable those clearance activities to be undertaken at pace. Activities that would normally take weeks or months to achieve have been done in very short order. And training. Training has revealed to us regional differences in the responses that are and the equipment that is in use. Those differences exist because of the regional um, requirements, because of the difference between the outer islands and, and the mountainous environment or the urban environment. So they're there for very good reasons, but it, it wasn't something we were familiar with. So training with our counterparts, as can be seen in some of the photos on the screen, has been fundamental um, to en enabling us to undertake efficient operations. The next slide, please. So when we look at the lessons that we have um, learned so far, and, and I should stress here that these aren't necessarily um, areas where we could have done things better. In some instances, there are ways that we would say, make sure you do this to, if this were ever to happen again, and let's hope it doesn't. The first one has to be flexibility. Um, the virus was still being learned about, is still being learned about, how we need to to respond to the virus changed frequently. What our requirement was and how we were going to provide a scalable response, how we were going to draw different echelons of defence together to provide a coherent response has meant that everybody has had to respond flexibly, be ready to change and be re ready to implement new models at pace. We've had to communicate carefully across all of the elements in defence to make sure that the focus has been correct, that the right things are prioritised to enable us to achieve that output. But we've also had to communicate really carefully with the regional authorities that we're supporting. What do they need? What do they know about us? What do they expect from us? And so our regional liaison officers that have been deployed to the headquarters have been critical. Training together, um, the UK Armed Forces and particularly the Rotary Force often train with our civil authorities, but we do it to train us, not them. We do it to prepare us for operations overseas. In this instance, we've been supporting them and it's a different nuance. We've had to understand how to work together, how to respond to medical emergencies, how to put their equipment and operate it safely on our aircraft. And training together has been an absolutely fundamental part of this process. I've talked to risk management and making sure that we have a robust process for risk management, making sure risks are owned by the appropriate people, making sure that they are understood and that they are mitigated to the best of our ability has been key. But fundamentally, when the military are called in to provide uh, military aid to the civil authority, it is because there is some, some concern that the civil authority may not be able to respond and therefore we are essentially the last line of defence. If when we are called upon we had all gone down with COVID-19 um, that wouldn't have been a good position to be in and so we have put robust mechanisms in place to guard against the COVID spread amongst our team. We've cohorted our workers, we've separated people, we've deployed people um, in to the north of Scotland in a group. We've put pre 
um, preventative measures in place and the decontamination measures in place as well as we can across the whole of the aviation task force in a coherent way to try and make sure that when we were called upon, we were there. That's all I have for now. I'm going to hand back to Mark. Thank you. Oh, that's great. Thank you very much. Um, next, we'll move on, on to the first of the uh, OEMs uh, across to you, Sam. Thank you, Mark, and I'd like to uh, thank the uh, Aeronautical Society for uh, hosting this webinar and allowing us to have an opportunity to speak. Um, I think that uh, you know this pandemic has evolved in such a rapid pace uh, across every geography that you know we've been very challenged to try to respond quickly. Um, and I think that OEMs and regulatory bodies uh, are not usually prepared to deal with things in days and weeks. Um, you know, normally these things take take uh, years. So I'd like to outline a little bit about what we've been doing um, in order to support operators uh, at the front lines. This is both, um, you know, regular EMS uh, sort of operate, uh, operations, as well as things that have been modified. So, you know, search and rescue, offshore agencies, uh, and stuff like that. Uh, you can go to the first slide, please. Um, so I think the the thing that has been the biggest challenge has been the the pace at which things are changing. So information has changed daily, um, and therefore our response has has uh, needed to change just as fast. Um, we focused on a couple of different areas uh, initially in order to support things as quickly and as uh, with the biggest amount of benefit uh, that we could um, to begin with. So that was <clears throat> decontamination procedures, separating the cockpit from the cabin area where the, um, the patients will be, um, and also biocontainment solutions. And then we looked at how different responses were happening in different areas of the world. And so that will be uh, the items that I, that I touch on. You can, next slide. So biocontainment devices, I think, you know, these have been around for a while. Um, they haven't been widely used or widely known about other than in, you know, very specific areas such as in Africa during the Ebola crisis. I don't even think there was a ton of them used during the, the SARS or MERS outbreaks. Um, so these provide a consistent positive airflow pressure throughout, uh, throughout the device essentially isolating the patient from any providers that are outside. So while that sounds uh, really good, and it, and it is good, there's also some challenges associated with this. Medical providers are not used to operating, you know, through a tunnel or, th you know, with gloves that are attached to it. So there's a fair amount of um, consideration that needs to go into both tra initial training as well as up upkeep those skills. There's also a cost associated with that, and there's the mechanics of actually making sure that it works inside of the aircraft. Uh, next slide. So I'm going to talk about two different uh, biocontainment devices. There's there's multiple, but there's two primary ones, and I think uh, you'll probably see this in the following presentations that there's uh, you know people are using these in a lot of different ways. So the first one is the ISOR series uh, N36 series which is collapsible. Um, so some benefits of this is it's relatively small and relatively portable. It's also relatively inexpen inexpensive. Um, you can see that it offers the, the blower system with a bunch of filters, as well as a lot of different access ports for the patient. It still doesn't allow for you to do things like CPR or certain invasive procedures. Um, so those are some of the things that are hindered by, by utilizing devices like this. Um, you can go to the next uh, next slide. And one of the neat things about both the Epi Shuttle and the ISOARC is that they're actually attaching to existing uh, litter systems that are within the aircraft. So from a regulatory perspective, one of the nice things has been that we're able to use these similar to uh, carry-on equipment. We have you know, worked pretty hard with both the ASA and FAA to get letters that sort of assure the operators that 
what they're doing is is still legal and safe. I think that has been one of the biggest challenges during this pandemic is trying to interface with you know ourselves, regulatory bodies, and operators in a really quick you know period of time. So normally EASA or the FAA would take you know months to study this, make sure everything was was done correctly, but we're not able to do that, especially as most of our people are working from home. Um, but you know, I, I think all of all of us have recognized the need to try to take care of patients and try to serve the citizens of our respective countries. And so there's been a really good collaborative effort on behalf of everyone um, that's been really nice to see. So the Epi Shuttle uh, is a more robust uh, containment device. You can see that it's sort of a rigid plastic. Uh, these are built more for uh, operations that are going to be doing this on a more regular, more permanent basis. Uh, they're, they're also more expensive, um, but they provide the same level of protection and uh, positive airflow throughout the entire system. Um, so they're, they've been pretty unique. Next slide. Decontamination has been um, has been a challenge, and I think Elizabeth, you know, talked about this that they were sort of prepared for doing this with MBC sort of things, and and no one. And my background is in EMS and medical EMS, and we would clean things afterwards, but uh, we've never really been prepared to totally decontaminate the entire interior of an aircraft before. Um, so there's been a bunch of different things that Leonardo has done. So we've identified a number of different chemicals that uh, we've assured are safe for all of the avionics and components. Um, there's also been some challenges where, you know, people want to use things like UVC, um, but we've not been able to, you know, in a very short period of time, do enough testing um, in order to certify that those are going to be safe for the aircraft. So the primary uh, methodology that's being used right now is fogging. And like I said, there's a number of chemicals that are that are being used for that. Um, it's a pretty good way of doing that completely. And when you combine that with uh, cockpit separations to remove the avionics and stuff like that, we're able to, and this allows the operators to dramatically reduce the amount of time that it takes them uh, to get back into service. So. When COVID first was happening, at least in the US, there was a period of airing out, which was about 30 minutes, then followed by a manual wipe down of all the equipment. And if you've ever seen the back of a EMS aircraft, medical people uh, are able to stuff stuff into pretty much every single corner that's in there. So it takes a really long time. The use of fogging allows for sort of a general decontamination in a much more rapid um, period of time. UVC is a very interesting, methodology because it doesn't use chemicals. Um, we're working really hard to study this quickly in order to provide recommendations to all of the operators out there. Uh, unfortunately, we do know that UV degrades uh, rubberized components, so we need to make sure that not, none of our seals or anything like that is affected by the use of uh, high-intensity UVC. Next slide. But this is probably where we uh, put the initial focus on and we're able to put out recommendations really quickly. And I think you're going to hear from Airbus next that, that they worked very similarly. Um, so we identified a number of ways that they can isolate the cockpit from the cabin. The reason that that's important is based on the previous slides that decontamination is also going to be important. All of those very sensitive avionics need to be separated. So for people that already had MVG curtains in place, we identified ways that they could um, separate those and get adequate seals. Uh, we also provided a number of solutions from third party vendors that were very quick um, in order to retrofit existing aircraft. Uh, and then in the future, we'll be providing this as, as part of a kit. Um, again, this has been a learning process, I think, for all of us across the spectrum, you know, whatever part of the chain you're in. Next slide. So some of the challenges and opportunities that I think we've that I think you know we've learned, um, and I'm also going to talk a little bit about sort of how different geographical areas have have dealt with this pandemic response, um, is 
I think this took all of us by surprise. And I think there's a lot of things that we can learn moving forward. The biggest one was that most people were not prepared with policies and procedures of how to handle something like this. So many operators were sort of developing policies and procedures based on their governing bodies recommendations, but those were changing on a daily or weekly basis, which was very challenging for the frontline operators. Um, the two pictures on the right, I will just point out that I've I've worn all that gear while trying to take care of really sick patients, and it's it's not enjoyable. Um, and so I think that it behooves all of us to take some time and do training uh, on a more regular basis. I think this has just shown us that we were not as prepared as we should be, and I think we have a great opportunity now to you know work with military authorities, civil authorities, OEMs. Um, and work on creating a better comprehensive plan. Next slide. Um, so in the United Kingdom, I think uh, Elizabeth just pointed out uh, really well how you guys have uh, ad adapted uh, and using the, um, the MACA system, you were able to integrate the military with the civil authorities um, based in the United States. That has not happened, and I, I think it would be much much more challenging. As you can see, there was a number of different uh, squadrons that were activated. I think it's important to note that, um, especially like the uh, A-20 Naval Air, Air Squadron had previous experience with this, having been deployed to Ebola. Um, also, the, um, the Argus has been deployed down to the Caribbean to assist with um, some of the territories down there. And, and I think the rapid mobility of the UK military has been a, a lesson that that a lot of different areas can can learn from. Next slide. Uh, Italy obviously was definitely a hot spot in the beginning. Uh, they also were able to coordinate both civil and military um, response to this. So they used AW-101s, put biocontainment devices in them, and were able to move patients. So the what happened in Italy is a little bit different than the traditional EMS system where normally you're trying to take patients from either uh, smaller hospitals or rural areas and bring them to larger centers. In Italy, they actually needed to move people from large centers to other large centers in different parts of the country because of the overwhelming patient populace. Um, so that was, you know, that was also a lot of good learning opportunity for you know, for how to mobilize patients across a health system. Um, and, and I think they did a, did a really good job. They also used the civil AW-139s and 169s fitted with biocontainment devices uh, to move patients. Next slide. <clears throat> Brazil did some similar things using offshore platforms, as well as uh, in the Caribbean and in the US, um, you know, traditionally offshore platforms have just a bunch of seats, they were able to quickly modify and we were able to provide um, those operators with some pretty quick solutions that would keep everyone safe. Next slide. <clears throat> and then in closing, I would just like to go back to the fact that, and I think you're gonna hear a lot of people today talking about very similar things. As this whole pandemic has progressed, uh, we've learned a lot. And I think one of the biggest things that we've learned about is that we could do a better job of preparing things and, uh, you know, being forward thinking. And uh, Leonardo is committed to working with our customers and our operators and making sure that we're taking care of both the pilots and the people working in the back, as well as the patients that they serve. Thank you very much. I appreciate your time. Uh, thanks a lot, Sam. Um, next, we'll hear from Stefan Bessel from Airbus. Hello, um, welcome, um, and thank you very much um, for this opportunity. So, yeah, my name is Stefan Bessler, and I would share our experience from the Airbus helicopter industry view. So, what customer requirements we had, what um, requests we had, um, support needed for COVID-19, and all the challenges the whole community had. Next. So it was like um, the colleague from Leonardo was already saying, it was a complete new uh, challenging situation we, were, we had never had before. It is the first really global and really big pandemic for decades. 
And um, this is a new situation for us as an OEM, but also, also for our customers, for operators, for service providers, for HEMS charities, for example, in UK, and for every individual person. And what was very um, needed is a quick adaptation and solution were required. So currently, the positive, I would say, the positive thing was that if we take the numbers of um, the global HAMS fleet, which is currently around 2,750 aircrafts worldwide, just for HAMS only, um, we saw that most of the services are flying. They are, are um, flying missions under COVID um, scenario. So normal missions, but also um, COVID-19 transports. And not only HAMS operators, I would say, are flying, but also now we have additional mission requirements from the military services, as we heard before, but also parapublic um, services, which are now used to transport patients. But we got also requests from other operators like offshore wind farm, oil and gas, pack transport, area work, uh, power line maintenance, etc. For example, one customer uh, told us from the offshore wind, they are flying more than before because the vessels are not used so much be um, because of um, disinfection topics. So now they're flying much, much more than before. So yeah, there are different scenarios. Um, it depends on the mission. It depends on the region. And um, next slide. The topic was that it was so surprising. It came very fast, this COVID-19 scenario. And what we all know, COVID-19 is not waiting. And as the colleague already said, normally it takes really quite a lot of time because there's an extensive process behind to um, do airworthiness process for new solutions. But this time now it's like a firefighting scenario, Keep, keeping, um, having solutions on the market for emergency services to save lives. It was everything was about protecting people and saving lives. And therefore we needed to have a fast response and quick win solution. So our first wave, um, what is now more in the final, what we did, it was really focusing on quick win solutions. Next. So the major topics um, um, uh, we were facing with and customers were approaching us was the most important and the first one was disinfection of the aircraft. How to disinfect the aircraft and with what material disinfectant um, to disinfect the aircraft. Then we had uh, the cockpit isolation um, topics to isolate the, the, the cabin and the cockpit to protect the pilots. Third, we had um, a lot of questions concerning this patient isolation devices, which were already presented also by Leonardo. And finally, there were wonders and questions about ventilation, heating and air condition system. And um, saying what was very important, and I think also um, what is very important is that we all need now to work together, sharing information, sharing experiences, and um, being open to really work together in this um, specific times because what is behind is saving lives. It's all about saving lives. And I think we are did here a great job. We have internally a, a very great global network. So we do a lot of exchange sessions within our people to inform them that they can inform their people, um, and their regional people, uh, customers. Um, they can train their specialists. And we have a great um, um, global network and we are on a daily contact with our customers, of course, with the operators. And we really try on a daily basis to improve our knowledge, to, to inform all the stakeholders to be as efficient as possible. Next. So the first priority, as I said, it was the disinfection of the aircraft. Therefore, we came out in March and we did two releases of an information notice. And it was this information notice was about the recommendation and guidance related to cleaning and disinfection of the aircraft. We recommended two consumables, um, Dismosompur and Corsoline Extra. First, 
And in the second release, we um, published a really, this is just a screenshot, um, so you cannot see very much, but um, it's only a part of it, um, a really a long list of disinfectants which can be used um, to disinfect the aircraft to help the customer. Because one challenge was also, um, again, this is a special time, that under normal days, under normal times, uh, disinfectants are available everywhere. But now we face a new problem that in some region, the disinfectants were not available anymore. Next. Though the second um, um, thing was um, information notice we published. It was a bit later, beginning of April. And this information notice was um, assisting the, the operators concerning the capping cockpit isolation devices. It's handled a little bit, it explained and provide um, um, details about the ventilating, heating and air condition system. And we treated also the patient isolation device topic. So the first priority, um, we got a lot of customer requests um, concerning this cockpit cabin isolation devices. And what we did was, um, what you see on the, on the left hand side, um, finally, um, step by step, we um, um, established solution. And again, it was really a quick win solution um, for different aircrafts, for a lot of wide range of, of aircrafts. And this solution is kind of a foil. Uh, I would call it do-it-yourself solution, what we developed and, and tested. And this is with a non-aeronautical material. Um, and the customer can buy it everywhere in the world. So this was also a challenge. It must be um, available globally by all the different customers. And then we came out with this foil solution, sep um, separation solution for the H215, so single engine helicopters, small helicopters, which are used very often globally to transport patients or for any other transport means. Um, we did it for all the helicopters, uh, DO-105, BK-117, for the most um, uh, frequently used HEMS helicopters, H-135, EC-145, H-145, and we went um, further to the 155, 175, and up to the Super Puma family, the 215 and the 225. And what we also did in that information notice, so um, we published or distributed the information again um, concerning our cockpit separation and NVG curtains, which are already used partly by operators who are doing um, NVG operations. So if it's already in, in use, it was a first protective measure, and this could be also ordered. Um, and in addition, for example, um, we have existing STC solution, like you see below, it's a hard plastic modular um, cockpit cabin separation um, from Mecca Air for the H145. Next. So here you see just how it looked like. This is one um, example of a H135, this, um, what I said, this quick wind solution with a foil coverage to protect the pilots. Next. Another topic in this um, information notice was uh, the explanation of the air distribution of the heating, ventilating, and air conditioning system. So we got a lot of, we received requests, um, what to do with the ventilating system, do, uh, air conditioning system, can I use it? Do I need to shut it down? So this treats um, this aspect, and we did it for the, again, um, starting for the single engine helicopter, H215, um, 125, sorry, H130, 135, 145, 75, um, two, uh, 155, and 215, and 225. Next. Another um, topic, like also explained by Leonardo, was um, this patient isolation devices. So I, uh, I have not the whole list of, um, but there is a big list. And like the colleague already said, the most um, famous um, two are perhaps the ISO art and the Epi shuttle. But what we see globally, there are so many devices and um, we informed our um, network also what, what is used um, globally. So there are a lot of um, regional solutions also. And we got two kind of questions from customer. 
One um, question was, for example, um, especially also from countries who are not so familiar with, with HEMS operations and, and, and um, these um, patient devices. What is available on the market? Do you know any operators? What are they using? So we shared information, what our operators are already using or preparing to use, what is possible, how to do this. And the other question was how to certify um, this solution um, or how to get the, 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 the authority validation to use this in a helicopter or what are the aspects. So we had here to, we assisted and supported our customer. We did um, on-demand NTO and some recommendation how to use these devices. We also gave the information, for example, the EASA homepage. They had this, uh, published also a document, uh, the airworthiness aspects of such devices, how to treat this. So this was also very well received by operators that um, authorities like EASA, the same, the same problem, the same challenge, I would say, to be reactive and, and they did also very good publications. Next. Then we had a sometimes request for special solution. So on demand, we support when it's possible on, on these special um, um, inquiries um, and um, we, we assist there um, when it's necessary to have new devices, new designs to save lives. So this is just an example of a French new design. This is a simple coverage of the patient attached to the stretcher and we um, had a look to that and we gave some a, a recommendation and it's now flown and accepted by the authorities in France. Samu is using that. So wherever we are able and wherever we can support, um, we assist our customers and, and to for installing of new devices or give some recommendation. Next. So that's the I'm through more or less. Thank you very much. Something to add. Um, again, I, I, I said at the beginning, I think in this crisis, we really need to work all together. We need to share information. We have to make things happen. And um, the solution you saw, this was a quick win. This is the first step. But the second step is now to think with our operators, with the customer, how we can improve, how to improve the safety, the efficiency of the helicopter missions, and what is needed in mid and long term to improve further the mission. So thank you very much. And I would um, like to give over to Mike, uh, to Mark. Sorry. Oh, um, thank you. Um, we'll now hear, hear from the first of the, the uh, Coast Guard spe speakers, so across to Clark Broad from Bristow. Well, hello, everybody, and thank you to the Aeronautical Society for allowing us to share our experience. Uh, first slide, please. Okay, um, I did say to Mark that I would talk about aircraft cleaning, and I will, um, but I really want to talk uh, mostly about our experience. Uh, so this is search and rescue's experience of the whole uh, uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic. I want to talk a little bit about where we were, uh, where we th we are now, and uh, where we think we're going. Next slide, please. Okay, so we thought we were in a pretty good place. We we had so this is at the beginning of the year. We had guidance and processes for infection prevention and control. We had PPE. We had stocks of FFP3 masks. We had a supply chain and we had aircraft um, uh, cleaning protocols. Next slide, please. So as they say, what could possibly go wrong? Uh, next slide, please. So um, our crews, very much like the rest of the population, were very, very fearful of this uh, virus. They didn't want to expose themselves or their families. Um, we had high levels of absence due mainly to self-isolation, uh, family members, um, and the epidemic actually appeared to be out of control. Um, as we started to uh, consider tasking, we found that our crews were not really familiar with the IPC guidance that we'd um, produced, 
and we had not face fitted our FFP masks. Um, and of course, as the pandemic spread, our, our fantastic supply chain, uh, which came from Germany, they put a hold on exporting any um, respiratory devices. So next slide, please. Uh, it probably wasn't the right thing to do uh, to uh, face fit our crews as we would have probably used up most of our stock to do that. Um, actually, initially, it was a it, the helicopter was not considered as an appropriate means to transport suspected or confirmed C-19 passengers. And I think all of our crews really appreciated the importance of the task, but, but everybody just felt really ill prepared and nobody had rehearsed or, or practiced this. And I can really, I can remember actually saying this, without some form of isolation pod, how are we ever going to cope and, and how wrong I was. Next slide, please. So where are we now? Um, so the offshore industry had an immediate need uh, to transport um, suspected C-19 people from the offshore, in, from offshore installations. Uh, and so we stood up a concept, we just happened to have a few um, S92s, um, SARFIT 92s sitting in a hangar, not doing very much. Um, and we um, basically set them up to uh, to transport um, people from offshore. And then and this is essentially where all our learning came. So it was ahead of really our preparations in search and rescue. To date, we've transported 120 suspected or actual COVID-19 um, people from offshore. Um, as I said, we've developed all of our protocols through this. Um, I'm going to show you a little a bit about cockpit barriers. We did it ourselves through our Part uh, 21 um, organization. Um, and now all of our um, SAR crews have been fitted with FFP3 masks. So we've got cockpit barriers, FFP masks, and we have declared essentially a, an aerosol generating procedure capability. And alongside everybody else, we can now transport the Epi Shuttle in the 189 uh, or the S92. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is a, a picture of the um, cockpit barrier in the 189. Next slide, please. And this is the barrier in the S92. Next slide, please. And this is us doing uh, loading trials um, and securing of the Epi Shuttle. Uh, this one is the A189, but we've also done it with the 92. Next slide, please. Okay, so where are we now? Um, we have a declared capability. So we're now using, um, I, I don't want to say too much about the Epi Shuttle. Somebody else might talk about that. But essentially, we consider that the helicopter is the containment vessels and our crews will wear appropriate PPE. So we've declared essentially we can transport people and conduct AGPs. Um, we have we found uh, winching really quite challenging uh, to protect our crews, and as of this week, we have found a way around that. Uh, and we can decontaminate our aircraft quickly and effectively. Um, most importantly, I think um, our crews are now gaining confidence that all of these initiatives and the PPE actually work, and they can see things like the CMED. Um, having transported so many people and there's no negative effects to the uh, crews that have done that. Uh, it's just been amazing how far we've come in six weeks. Next slide, please. So I am going to talk a little bit about decontamination of um, aircraft. Uh, this is my jokey slide because we don't actually have one of those, but something similar. And I just want to pick up on a couple of points that were made a little bit earlier. Um, this whole experience has been uh, about sharing of information, and, I, and we don't say it very often, but I'd also like to say how supportive the Civil Aviation Authority has been uh, in helping us accelerate modifications, et cetera, give us alleviations and dispensations. Um, next slide, please. Okay, a very, very quick through. We're, we're using pretty basic kit. So this is a, a normal decontam kit. Uh, for body fluid spills. Um, we essentially use BioGuard as the uh, disinfectant, the anti back spray. Next slide, please. Uh, this is a list of the content. So if you get um, a copy of this presentation, it's all there for you. Uh, next slide, please. So we did start using the biofogging machines. This one 
um, is an electrostatic version, which um, is not really very good for aircraft. So we turn the, elect the electrostatic functionality off, but it does speed up. So we use this device essentially to clean our CMED uh, um, aircraft um, every evening. Uh, it's not suitable for the um, cockpit. Next slide, please. So this is just really um, the PPE um, that uh, you wear when you're going to do your cleaning. Next slide, please. And the next slide. And that's it. Great. And OK, and just stop there. So essentially, we have a, a decision making tree that allows us to decide what level of um, cleaning is required for the for the tasking that's been done. Next slide, please. And it's essentially working from the back, moving forward, um, spraying, wiping, cleaning and disposing uh, and then disposing of appropriately. And next slide, please. We have a number of checklists. Uh, this just helps. Next slide, please. So aircraft cleaning, rotors running checklist. And the next slide, please. I think there was a cockpit one, but that's fine. OK, and the next slide, please. OK, where do we think we're going? Um, we're trying to position ourselves uh, as an organization and our people. Most importantly, um, this is a government led recovery plan. And we're just trying to really support the UK very much as the military is doing. Um, we are trying to support specifically uh, retrieval team teams around the UK who have uh, air ambulances have, have had uh, probably more challenges in, in that their machines are very small. Um, so again, we have larger helicopters and sometimes it's um, helpful uh, to have the larger helicopters. We definitely need to keep doing search and rescue, um, although our tasking rates have dropped by about 75%. And, and really, our main goal is not only to support uh, people in the UK, but also to keep our people safe. And really, we're just adapting to the new normal, whatever that is. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Clark. Um, next, it's across to um, David Ward. Uh, thank you, Mark, and uh, thank you to the Aeronautical Society for the invite. Hello, you're all very welcome. I'm David Ward. I'm the Chief Crewman Medical Standards for CHC Ireland. We provide a Coast Guard helicopter service to the Irish state. I'm going to look at a, a brief insight into our experiences to date on the novel coronavirus. Next slide, please. So in truth, uh, we had the benefit of the awful misfortune experienced by our neighbouring countries um, our nearest neighbours and in Europe. Um, and to put that into context, um, by the time we had our first case, Italy already had 21 deaths, the UK had 20, Italy had 820 cases. You know, moving on then to the 11th of March, we had our first death and um, 43 cases. Uh, at that stage, Italy had 196 deaths and over 2,300 deaths. So we were well aware of, um, this helped us uh, become well aware of what was coming uh, maybe two or three weeks down the road. What we've done straight away then is we pretty much um, limited all um, school visits um, and outside contact with um, anybody else coming to the bases. Straight after that then, um, on the 13th, what we've done is we sterile, uh, had a sterile shift handover process. So crews never mixed, uh, offgoing crews and oncoming crews never mixed. It was done over the phone. We restricted staff movements around other bases and siloed the bases. Um, and also we, we, um, we, we any non-essential staff were asked to work from home. I can go to the next slide, please. Okay, um, in terms of engagement, um, what we've done is we, we discussed what our, uh, our concerns with our customers and merged their needs with our expectations to uh, try and maintain um, service stability. Uh, in conjunction with that, we also had weekly updates with the customer on any impact uh, COVID-19 may have had to our service. It's important to note that we have a quite a small amount of uh, technical crew or any crews. I think the numbers are quite small. So if any crew, uh, you know, maybe two or three people had tested positive on one uh, base that would have a damaging effect on our roster. So we had to take a very, very serious and um, very, very, um, very soon. Um, next slide, please. OK, so actions taken. What we've done is um, we already had um, um, the availability of an, an expert um, outside private cleaning company, BJR Cleaning. 
um, we had them in conjunction with a, um, a clinical governance uh, process that we, we we went through maybe two years ago. So we had them to lean on straight away. What we've done is straight straight away we actually increased our cleaning intervals from deep cleaning intervals of the aircraft um, from uh, 60 days to 30 days, um, and obviously any post events then would clean the aircraft as well. Other things we've done is we, we contacted OEMs, um, for example, our immersion supervisor, um, and asked them, um, you know, in conjunction with our, our private uh, cleaning company, what chemicals were appropriate to use on, on, the, uh, on the surfaces of their suits. Um, a big thing for us, uh, certainly a learning experience, was bespoke guidance, you know, um, and videos in terms of donning and doffing equipment. Um, another thing we utilised was uh, emergency uh, physician advice in Medico Cork. What we've done here was, we, we use them to risk assess the pros and cons of certain taskings. For example, maybe, um, you know, if there was a stable patient, you know, 150 miles off the West Coast with COVID-19, we would use the physician's advice to assess would it be prudent to take them off or to contain them on the vessel and head to port. That gave our crew certainly a bit of reassurance that we weren't just going to get sent out to everything and possibly, you know, uh, you know bring us into contact with the, uh, with the, the virus uh, um, needlessly. Next slide, please. Uh, I think it's fair to say that because of all these actions that we took, uh, it put us in, in, in a good position, but it, it, it only gave us breathing space. Uh, another thing that we've done is um, we linked in with other services, particularly the National Ambulance Service, who are kind of looking after the testing nationally. Um, we, 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 we had a, a system set up through our accountable manager that um, our guys could get tested very, very quickly if they experienced any um, symptoms. And then obviously with the consent of the actual individual, we would report back straight to the um, the the, the, the HSE would report back straight to the MG um, account to manage the results. Um, what's important to note here is uh, there could have been a delay of seven to ten days by the time it got to your GP and finally got to the um, the individual. So this was certainly something really really beneficial to us getting the crews um, back onto uh, onto the roster or you know continuing our service stability. We we guaranteed annual leave if it was uh, cancelled. Um, you know uh, as we'd isolated the bases. Um, if, if anyone got sick, we wanted to make sure that we could continue the service. We uh, limited straight away, we limited our uh, training. Uh, we went for ops and essential training only, which was very important. So we, we, we again, there was a lot of, I, I suppose for all the countries involved, there was a lot of stress and anxiety. And this was one way of you know easing that at a local level and um, for our crews. We also uh, got involved in online training courses for our technical crew with the World Health Organization. And uh, to date, what we actually do is uh, in regular flights, whether it be training or missions, um, in terms of the guidance of two meters in 15 minutes, um, we all wear surgical masks on board the aircraft. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is uh, just an example of one of our tailored guidance. And it was really, really important because we were getting lots of advice and lots of guidance, but it wasn't tailored to our um, to our specific needs. And it would actually cause more stress and anxiety for individuals. So it was really important to come up with our own testing pathways for all the pros and cons in our, um, in our operation. And this was produced by our safety and quality team. Next slide, please. Uh, learning experiences, certainly for myself, tailored guidance is key because there's always differences or you know idiosyncrasies between what's being published and what actually pertains to you and i found that crews were far more comfortable with tailored guidance uh, regular communication uh, was very very important it was an ever-changing landscape i think one of our presenters mentioned it, it actually changed daily and um, for most of us um, and we had to keep uh, on top of uh, the information that was coming out um, Information overload was was quite an important, uh, you know, was, was was perceived as a bit of a problem maybe um, in terms of we we're getting lots of information and, and what was pertinent and what wasn't. Uh, there's a great saying, "How do you eat an elephant?" Small bites. So we tried to give the the, the pertinent information out to the guys um, and, and let them understand it, rather than just constantly barraging of of information, which can happen. Um, one of the things we've done, and we'll probably have a look at it in a couple of slides, um, and uh, I wouldn't dream of taking credit for it, was we harbored a culture of creative uh, uh, thinking and, and ideas and solutions. And without a doubt, um, some of the best um, ideas came from the crews themselves, um, and not certainly from myself. I wouldn't want to take credit for that. Um, moving on to the next slide, please. The PP guidance, yeah, we probably similar to everybody else, we've got surgical face masks, FFP2s, FFP3s. Um, one thing that we found interesting was beards, for example. How do you, how do you, you know, um, manage people with beards? We were very quite, quite, quite clear. We says, you know, we gave the advice that, um, you know, that the masks wouldn't be, uh, um, wouldn't work if you had a beard, and it'd be proved to be cleanly shaven. And, and in, in fairness, everyone uh, followed the guidance. And um, but it, you have to be very mindful of of how you portray this sort of information. We gave them clear understanding that if you had a beard, it wouldn't work. And, and don't be fooled into thinking it would. And it really encouraged people to take this serious. 
Um, there's a lot of pressure um, very early on to, to buy everything, um, you know, and we'll have a look at that in slides later on. Um, it mightn't be the answer to everything. And in terms of, you know, what's good for one operator, you know, that might be similar to us in another country, may not be similar to ours. So again, information is key here because if people are seeing other things that have been bought or used around the globe, and I think, and why isn't it for us? So, you know, certainly myself, I gave regular updates and say, look, this is what we're looking at. Uh, we haven't made the decision and keep the information coming. Um, next slide, please. Yeah, I found this very interesting. It's, it's definitely worthy of a note on the presentation. And um, we'd already documented the dangers of hand sanitizer um, and compressed gases within our own, uh, within our own medical manuals. Um, but if I'm honest, I hadn't seen this one before. And if I read down through it, uh, after application, but before the liquid uh, sanitizer had fully evaporated and dried, the individual touched the metal surface where a buildup of static created an ignition source and the hand sanitizer ignited, resulting in an almost invisible flame. And this was a result of what actually happened. So again, we got this out to everybody as a safety alert, just to let them know. And um, I mean, I, you know, even at home, you know, it was important to mention this at home, even to my own kids, it was quite interesting because it's something that you probably just consider everyone to understand, but maybe they don't understand it. Um, next slide, please. Okay, in terms of equipment, I won't go into too much depth um, in the next three slides, but um, I'll be happy to take your uh, questions at the end. Um, what I'll say about this uh, piece of equipment, um, these are the helmets that we use. Um, we are looking at these closely, and um, we believe that they're in the early stages of production, and then um, we're giving them some serious consideration. Next slide, please. Probably two of the most prominent pictures today in everyone else's presentation, the um, Epi Shuttle on the left and the ISO Arc on the right. We, we did look at these. Um, again, we linked in and engaged with national services. We found out that um, they'd already bought two ISO arcs during the Ebola outbreak, um, and they were pretty certain they weren't going to use them um, or have a requirement for us to use these um, in, in the current climate. And what's probably different to us and other service providers um, even presenting here today is Ireland is such a small country in terms of helicopter evacuation with one of these epi shuttles or, or, or containment devices. It probably wasn't really for our needs. Um, next slide, please. Um, okay, so some more equipment we looked at, and um, the two on the left, the snood and the UV box, are uh, we're in discussions at the moment and considering them. Um, at the bottom one, the priority one air stretcher, it's a great system, but it wasn't for our, for us, so we, I think we've decided not to go down that route. And um, what's interesting is the the goggles, um, the UVX goggles. We, we we purchased them. We got great feedback from the guys saying that they fogged up. We bought uh, anti fog spray, and um, then we'd also issues with uh, practitioners trying to administer medication. Um, again, great feedback from the guys saying you know they couldn't really focus or, or read the, 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 the drugs um, and so, so uh, what we've done was we we offered them um, prescription uh, safety goggles uh, if they required and um, it's important to note that the um, most of these uh, these bits of equipment um, are my opinions and, and obviously may suit your needs I think it's it's, it's bespoke to an individual service um, and it's, it's only my experience uh, experience uh, opinions expressed should I say uh, next slide please Okay, important factors. Okay, it was uh, definitely it was really important for us and is important for us to continue, um, you know, uh, establish links with the national services, whether that be testing or understanding the new guidance or understanding what guidance they're giving, so we can give something uh, similar if it suits our needs. And um, it allowed us to say to test crews quickly, engage with uh, your medical director. I think having a well-placed medical director is is absolutely vital in terms of getting the right information, and the right guidance. Um, what we did do is we applied more stringent rules where applicable. So, for example, we had one um, one um, technical crewman um, test positive. The guidance actually said to um, trace back 48 hours. We went back several days and tested the previous crew. He flew it, um, which was which was great because it was keeping us ahead of the virus um, uh, if there was a problem on the base. As I said earlier on, and I think my second slide, we have a limited amount of crew, and uh, you know a couple of guys getting tested or a couple of guys get testing positive, should I say, would have a damaging effect on the roster. Um, structure, yeah, having a great structure in place, you know, to be fair to the management team, uh, you know, they're continuing to work really, really hard behind the scenes to um, to allow that to happen. And um, particularly in you know, the technical crew area, we've, we've, we have a number of structures in place that we can actually, there's a lot of information going around, there's a lot of things to be done, and having one or two guys doing it all on their own would never have worked. So I think we're, we're kind of seeing the benefit of the structure we have in place. Um, next slide, please. Um, okay, so key points, yeah. Track the, the 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 guidance changes daily. What we notice is they could change at you know outside of um, business hours. They could change at nine o'clock in the evening or nine o'clock in the morning. So what we did is we had op ops calls every morning and would track the changes. And if there's anything to note, I'd bring it up and then obviously apply it to us if we needed. Again, 
harboring uh, you know a, 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 um, you know an inclusive culture uh, was really really important because then guys you know there's a huge amount of stress a huge amount of um, um, anxiety whether it be you know work related or from home or even just in the community whether you've got elderly patients or parents so i mean by, by encouraging people to bring up great ideas and then 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 talking them through them um, in, in 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 open form um was, was brilliant it, it kind of gave us a, a great insight into you know the understanding of how the crews are feeling and um, again not to buy everything um there was a lot of pressure when people are presenting all these things to buy everything straight away i don't think throwing the money is, is certainly the answer in every case certainly in some cases i think the key thing here and you'll see it in my next slide is uh, to stay two steps ahead um, a good structure in place policies procedures communication and what's also important to know about communication is uh, indecision any indecision uh, uh, can cause anxiety and i've seen that uh, firsthand so I'd be very very mindful of of you know staff stresses that that, that may be uh, ongoing again so what was really really um, i suppose great for us was we have a professional cleaning company um, with approved Sikorsky pr uh, products in place in a decontamination locker um, and a call-out system. So again, we increased the, uh, the, the, the we doubled the, the cleaning procedures, um, but also we had great um, um, professional advice to lean on at any stages, and that really put us in a good place in terms of bespoke um, cleaning requirements for us. Um, next slide, please. Um, yeah, I think um, two steps ahead. If, if if I leave it with no other message today, I think that that was the thing and is the thing for us. When no, by no means through the woods yet, but in a world of you know KPIs, justification of your management, um, you're already behind the curve before you even get out of bed. Um, but we were very lucky, as you know, with Dr. Mark, uh, Mike Ryan from uh, the WHO, the Executive Director, and Ireland's Chief Medical Officer, Dr. Tony O'Hulahan. They were very very clear about you know progressive measures, uh, and. Their advice gave us the confidence to make decisions like siloing the bases, restricting travel, and, and you know, and if there's an impact to the to, to the um, service, well, so be it. But it would actually it would actually isolate the bases and continue the service and reduce the risk. Um, yeah, I suppose um, our next biggest challenge, and um, like I have to stress, I was only looking at something last night. We're not through the woods yet. Um, the biggest challenge is not just to come to your own success to date. Um, we've got here by design, not luck. And I don't think we should um, take the foot off the gas just yet. Um, next slide, please. Um, yeah, just before I conclude, I, I'd like to say, and I'm not saying for a moment that we've got everything right. It's been a huge learning curve, and it's great to see everyone being open and honest about um, 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 other um, learning um, experiences. And um, for us, you know, it's 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 a daily thing. We're learning on the hoof. It took us all by surprise, um, but um, you know, we're going to keep an open mind, um, continuous reflection continuous communication and, and feedback. And remember, uh, we've only survived first contact. The second wave is gonna come and we gotta play the long game as a service provider um, or any of the service providers out there. Um, you know, while, yeah, again, while we have to adapt our behaviors in order to live safely with uh, this COVID-19 until a vaccine or treatment is available. I mean, yeah, we, we, we just gotta be really, really cautious. It's, there's certainly no time to clap yourself on the back and say you're through the woods. We still have PPE issues in terms of supply. Um, you know, I think everyone around the world is having the same issues. Um, next slide, please, Kira. Yeah, look, the, the stats are the stats. They're still climbing in what's considered a containment phase. You know, so I mean, it's just it's 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 quite stark. And when you see it written down, you know, four million cases, nearly over a quarter of a million deaths in 215 countries. Bring that more local to ourselves in Ireland. Uh, next slide, please, Kira. You know, we have. You know, 23 uh, over 23,000 confirmed cases and just over 1,400 actual deaths right now. Um, you know, at this stage, you know, I'd like to thank all the staff, uh, particularly um, for the continuous efforts and understanding. I think what I have noted from everyone else's presentation is, you know, there was a lot of anxiety and stress, and um, I think you know, I think it's, I think it was similar to our own um, staff as well. So I mean, you know, I, I think their efforts to try to get us through this and continue to get us through it, um, you should be noted. Um, and finally, you know, um, I'd like to wish you and your uh, your countries all the best in the fight against uh, this pandemic. That pandemic. Thanks for sharing your experiences, and I'll leave you with this final thought, which I thought was quite apt in the current climate, and um, from a famous poet and Irish playwright, Oscar Wilde. Um, uh, we're all in the gutter, but some of us are looking at the stars. And I think if you want to be the operator looking at the stars, I think for me the message is, you know, be two steps ahead and, and you know make make the brave decisions. Thank you very much uh, for your time. And um, there's my uh, contact details if you want to contact me. Thank you. Hi, David. Um, thank you um, very much for that. Next, we're going to hear from John Erlinson from the Icelandic Coast Guard. 
Thank you, Mark, and uh, hi to everybody. Uh, we can go to the first slide, please. Well, the Coast Guard in Iceland is, uh, these are our assets. We have uh, three helicopters, two Airbus H225s and uh, one 332. And we have a fixed wing also, maritime special patrol aircraft. And to sort of give you um, the overview of this, these are the only assets in Iceland. We have no military, no army or anything which would back us up. So one of our primary objects in the beginning when this pandemic started picking up was to keep our crews and these assets flying and not have uh, an infection affect our operation. So from the beginning, with the help of the Department of Civil Protection and the Health Director of uh, Health in Iceland, we were never supposed to be the primary uh, capability of moving a COVID patient. It would always be tried to be done somewhere else or somehow else because the risk of infection would just take our operation down and uh, the, um, the department of uh, the, the flight ops is only 50 people. So it would quickly diminish if something would happen. So like uh, everybody else is has been saying today, we changed procedures, shift patterns, uh, closed the canteen, uh, no guests, everything was changed, new procedures, new checklists. So we tried to uh, adapt to um, a different scenario to keep us operating and not affecting our uh, capabilities. So next slide, please. So if you look at Iceland, you'll see the orange lines, which are straight lines to the main um, cities or towns across the island. And these are normally uh, done by a Beach 200 ambulance flight, which transports just uh, between hospital, the main capital in Reykjavik, down in the left corner. So all COVID patients were transported normally through these channels by that aircraft. They normally do like, uh, I think, uh, approximately two flights a day, at least during the whole year. But uh, I, I don't have any specifics on how much this picked up now in the pandemic, but they normally do this. We knew that the, uh, the places that we would probably have to uh, help out with would be where I have uh, drawn the green lines, which is up in the west, uh, Isa Fjordur, which is can be a nasty place weather-wise, and Westman Islands down in the south. So these two places are prone to getting low visibility, bad weather. So at some point we knew that we would have to go to these two places or one of them and pick up a COVID patient because the normal ambulance flight could not reach it. So we prepared with the checklist and uh, procedures that we got help from the uh, Director of Health about how to handle. We uh, got some PPE equipment. We had some before, but uh, we had to look at all these things again, try to minimize how uh, our uh, crews would get infected. So uh, one of the things that the hospital in Iceland, the National Hospital had bought, so if we go to the next slide, please was the Epi Shuttle. They uh, purchased one of these. They have some other uh, types also, which they have been using for the uh, Beach 200 and the ambulances. But uh, we were supplied with this one to use. And uh, through the um, EASA guideline, guidelines, we uh, got an exemption because we did not have any uh, means of uh, an STC or anything to use this. So we have an exemption until June, at least now, to use this and secure it in the cabin. And uh, we've uh, done one transport up to uh, the western part of Iceland. And that was done at, uh, like I said, bad weather was hampering the need, the, the uh, use of the normal aircraft. So we had to go there. So normally we, we can fly NVG day, night, all weather. So uh, it doesn't make the flights easier. So it doesn't really make the flight in the back even easier and have to use this equipment which we found was quite intimidating to have someone in there and uh, you can't really access him so just easy things like hooking up monitors giving oxygen 
everything becomes really difficult and even though the guidelines on using this says you can put in a six foot six 330 pound person it's not going to be easy to operate or do anything so these were the things that we were sort of trying to prepare prepare for but in this one one uh, transport we really found out that how hard this can be and uh, we've tried to tailor our uh, procedures we'll have to constantly look at them again now and see if we need other equipment and uh, and change the way we think this because just by if you look at the the top left corner picture this is a normal place where we have our stretcher you can only access one side of the uh, epi shuttle so what we did is move it out to the center of the floor so you can at least access it from both sides from the back from the front and like some of our doctors said uh, at some point if we have a that critical patient the hut is going to go off and we're going to just deal with it with normal ppe for the uh, for the uh, staff so the, the, there there's a lot of challenges there and uh, it, it's good that we have not had to do many of these but uh, we'll still prepare to do more but uh, today there's nobody uh, getting infected uh, for three days at least so uh, we're on the right track in Iceland, but uh, we are only 330,000, so we're not many. Uh, next slide, please. So in the aircraft, we prepared that uh, we could put in the Epi shuttle in the back of the Dash 8. We can't put it in the front cabin due to mission equipment. So we have a big door in the back. We can load it. There's no seat for any doctor or a medical person in the back to help out with this, but um, uh, we could at least transport people and help out if needed so we gave us that option but this is like i said before limited to an as i'm assumption so we would always have to try to get an stc for something else later on uh, i was not going to tell you about anything more about the icelandic coast guard thank you very much uh, john thank you um we'll uh, now move on to the final speaker who is Andy Dutch from um, 710 um, Naval Air, Air Squadron. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name's Andy Dutch. Uh, I work for 1710 Naval Air Squadron at um, Portsmouth Dockyard in Hampshire. The requirement to disinfect aircraft is not a new concept. Um, the need usually presents itself about every five years or so. Uh, we've repeated this for foot and mouth, bird flu, SARS, MERS, Ebola, and now COVID-19. There are many products uh, available to disinfect surfaces. However, experience and testing has shown us that most commercial disinfectants are detrimental to aerospace materials. Some commercial products have been authorized for use on some rotary wing aircraft. These have been authorized by the larger aircraft manufacturers that also produce civil passenger aircraft for the most part. Uh, the difficulty we have with these disinfection materials are that they are developed um, from the disinfection procedures for passenger airliners. These have extensive soundproofing and panelling that effectively isolate the structure from the cabin. This means the chance of disinfectants coming into contact with sensitive aircraft structure is low. This isn't the case on most military aircraft. We have very little soundproofing, very little panelling, and there's a lot of exposed structure. When you read the detail of these disinfection procedures, they invariably have cautions that advise users not to allow contact of disinfectants with aircraft structure. Whilst our highest priority must be the safety of personnel, we must not lose sight of the importance of protecting and preserving our aircraft from the longer term threats that can be posed by the need to disinfect. Next slide, please. To disinfect an aircraft, we need to disrupt the virus. This basically means we need to penetrate the lipid bilayer to allow an RNA destroying substance into the virus or alternatively remove the entire envelope. There are two strategies available to disinfect aircraft, passive or active. Passive effectively means to weather them, that is to park them out of the way somewhere and not go near them for at least three days. This is rarely, if ever, gonna be operationally acceptable. We just don't have enough aircraft. So we have to actively disinfect our aircraft. Chemical disinfection of the virus can be achieved with a large number of species of disinfectants, 
However, delivery of the disinfectant is also important. And the methods of delivery are uh, threefold. There is wiping. Uh, this gives the most complete coverage. This is the most effective method of delivering the disinfectant to the virus. Secondly, there's low level aerosolization without spray, uh, so spraying, but without wiping. And this is the least effective at ensuring coverage and presents a risk of the disinfectants entering or landing on components and services that could be damaged. And finally, there's fogging. This gives much better coverage than spraying, but it's still not complete coverage. Add to that the virtually no control over where it goes, so there is a high probability that disinfectants will penetrate sensitive equipment and come into con contact with materials that will be damaged. Uh, next slide, please. There are many different substances that can be used to deactivate SARS-CoV-2. Uh, here we've split them into six simple groups, which I'll outline now. Um, all detergents, soaps and surfactants are highly effective at rendering the virus unviable. Although most surfactants are not damaging to aircraft materials, commercial formulations almost always contain additives. Uh, these will include acids or salt uh, as buffering solutions, which pose a significant risk of corrosion to aircraft materials. Oxidizers such as sodium hypochlorite, which is bleach, and hydrogen peroxide create highly reactive oxygen species that rapidly inactivate any virus. However, oxidants will cause significant and rapid corrosion to metal and degradation of elastomeric and polymeric materials such as seals and sealants. All strong oxidizers have been ruled out for use on aircraft. Alcohols, um, these are already widely used as disinfectants and are highly effective against viruses. Two types are commonly used, methanol and isopropanol. Both of these solvents can da cause damage to polymers and um, with uh, prolonged contact. However, contact time on materials will be low as they evaporate quickly, usually less than 60 seconds. This minimizes any del deleterious effects. Isopropanol is commonly available and frequently used on aircraft for cleaning, de -icing, uh, degreasing and de-icing. Then we have quaternary ammonium compounds. Uh, these have been shown to be highly efficient uh, against SARS-CoV-2 in laboratory tests. The most common are a group of substances called benzylconium chloride. This is in some disinfectant products used on commercial jets. 1710 Squadron have tested these materials and medium and long-term contact with metals can lead to significant corrosion. Acids and alkalis, these need to have a pH value of less than two or greater than 11 to be efficient against the virus. These pH values are generally deleterious to light alloys used in the construction of aircraft. And finally, we've got radiation, particularly UVC radiation. It is effective at destroying SARS-CoV-2. However, an exposure time of around 15 minutes will be required to ensure that disinfection is effective. It's purely line of sight and anything shadowed will not be disinfected. Also, UVC causes damage to elastomeric and polymeric comp uh, components. Next slide, please. A series of testing programs were started as soon as the military's involvement in COVID-19 pandemic was confirmed. DSTL has been testing a number of different disinfectants for their efficacy against SARS-CoV-2. 1710 Naval Air Squadron is testing a much wider selection of disinfectants for their compatibility with aircraft materials. Uh, we are using standard immersion tests to check disinfectants against materials commonly used on aircraft, including aluminium alloys, mild steel, stainless steel, copper, CAD plated steel, also uh, a standard scratch paint system and acrylic and polycarbonate transparency materials. Uh, these are also being tested. Some early results are now available and as expected oxidizers, acids and alkalis are very damaging to most aerospace materials and we have seen some damage to aluminium alloys when in contact with benzylconium chloride. Mild steel and 7075 aluminium show some very minor corrosion with extended exposure to isopropanol and isopropanol also cause stress crazing in a pre-stressed acrylic material uh, but no short-term effects have been seen in polycarbonate materials. Next slide, please. There have been and continue to be a large number of suggestions for disinfection products from many sources. The general approach is that materials are not allowed to be used on MOD aircraft until a safety assessment has been completed. 
It's not possible to take uh, undertake physical testing of all suggested products. As suggestions for disinfectants come in, we assess their constituents against those we have seen and tested before. And where a product has constituents that we've not seen before, samples are obtained and subjected to physical testing. In all cases, the products are reviewed by a team of experienced chemists and engineers. Next slide, please. So where are we at the moment? At the moment, for detailed and small area disinfection, MOD is using uh, isopropanol as a wipe. It's good for cleaning discrete high touch areas such as switches, handles and handholds. It does have a short and long term exposure limits under COSH EH40, therefore should be lim its use should be limited and the COSH assessment should reflect this risk. Isopropanol is particularly unsuited to be sprayed or aerosolized, particularly in confined areas because of the danger of reaching both the SDL and the uh, uh, LTL, uh, and also the um, reaching the lower explosive limit, which is 2%. For larger areas, we're using aircraft wash fluid to AMS 79-017. There are several companies producing material to this standard. Uh, it has a very high pH, but it does include corrosion inhibitors. It is tested and is safe for use on all aerospace materials. This is the standard to, uh, to which we're testing all the other candidate disinfectants. We need to keep wash fluid away from avionics and electrical systems, uh, and we must be careful to prevent slip hazards and limit any rise in humidity uh, in aircraft, which would increase the uh, risk of avionic and electronic electrical failure, failures. Uh, next slide, please. So what are we doing for the future? Currently, we believe we have uh, effective and safe methods of disinfection for military aircraft. Wash fluid was tested against Ebola virus by DSTL and was at least an order of magnitude better than most other disinfectants on the market, particularly the ones recommended for aircraft. The primary issue with the current MOD processes is the speed of disinfection. Hand wiping is relatively slow, but very effective. Current faster materials and methods come with significant and unacceptable risks, particularly in the military aircraft, both in the efficient efficacy of the disinfection and the airworthiness of the aircraft. A small number of products under test are showing quite low levels of damage. However, there would have to be a significant advantages shown uh, for us to adopt new disinfectants or processes. These would include being safer for aircraft or personnel, greater efficiency against the virus, as well as quicker action or quicker overall process times for disinfection, uh, which would allow us improved turnaround times and increased availability. Um, that's all I have to say. Thank you for your time and I'll return you to the chair. Andy, thank you. Um, right, thank you to, to all, all of the um, speakers and, and especially for being so open and Frank with the issues you faced. We've now got a few minute, minutes left for um, questions. Um, and some of those um, questions have been, been fed through. The first one, I, I've got a question for Elizabeth um, Gilbertson. Have any of the um, military um, retro-wing um, processes and pr um, procedures are identified through the C-19 Act activity being deemed to have a long-term um, positive effect and the impact? Um, thank you for the question and uh, yes, in, sh in short is a good answer. Um, we've implemented for certain aircraft uh, crewman role changes which haven't been done on some aircraft uh, previously or for some time. So crewman role changes have been approved. They will be um, in situ now for um, the, the remaining life of the aircraft. On top of that, we've we've trained at some of our aircrew a process that is in place for the Royal Navy, but hadn't been in place for um, some of the RAF's fleets. We're now il allowing some of our crews to undertake maintenance on um, some of their safety survival equipment. Um, for a period of up to 48 hours, which provides them the opportunity to deploy away from home base more in a more unsupported capacity. Um, preventative de decontamination. We have, we have seen not just COVID-19, but other viruses not spreading as significantly, um, partly we think because of preventative decontamination. We now have those processes in, available to us. 
we have those processes ready to be deployed if they need to be so whilst they won't be applied once we emerge from the covid situation routinely if we were to have any other viral outbreak that we wanted to control those they are ready and can be used um acans so uh, the Aviation uh, Command um, and Navigation System has been procured for us to be able to operate with um, the civil authorities uh, and the emergency services more effectively. Um, those assets will continue to be used when we're operating in the appropriate environments. Um, and then um, a very simple one, it would seem, but remote working. Um, normally, when we set up a headquarters, we pile everybody into quite a small and contained space. On this occasion, we've distributed people and a good number of our headquarters staff are working from home routinely. Um, it's demonstrated to us that, that it can be done and, and exploiting the, the technology that's available to us is something that we will probably take forward in the future. Thank you. Hi, thank you. The next um, question I have is a question to, to Airbus. Have there been any requests and answers, et cetera, from the German armed um, forces for their NH-90s and CH-53s? Yeah, as I know that that was handled by the by our military colleagues. Um, at the beginning, we had an exchange. There were some requests, but I don't know all the details. So, but um, I can answer directly, Dave Harris. I can find this out. Uh, but there was some communication on it <clears throat> and this, there was another question um, the criteria to return to normal um, operation um, honestly currently we were more in the still in the wave of quick wins so this is now the next step um, we need to contact now customers um, what they need what are the requirements also what we heard from the iceland coast was it Iceland Coast Guard, I think. Um, so we have this um, paragraph 17, which is a temporary uh, um, um, situation for these um, AP shuttles, for these isolation devices. So the question is also to our customer in the future, are um, STC solutions required? What we need to do um, now for mid and long term to pr improve the situation. So this is, uh, I would say, now the next step we are going into. Right, thank you. And the next um, question is to both of the OEMs, so to uh, Sam and to um, Stefan. Um, and I'll just bring it up here. And it concerns your uh, emergency um, response plan. Um, what have you, you learned from this and what can you, you change in, in the future for your emergency response plans? Do you want to go first, Stefan, or you want me to start off? Yeah, please. Okay. So I think you know I think one of the challenges um, for for all of us is that uh, you know both for OEMs as well as operators is we tend to deal with the problem that's right in front of us. And I think it was David that that spoke about thinking two steps in front of you. Um, so we've definitely been challenged with. Uh, you know, trying to react to this. Um, we obviously interface pretty closely with both regulatory bodies as well as customers. And so all of those people, so ourselves, regulatory bodies, and the operators are trying to react to this constantly changing information. Um, I think, as a number of people said, that we've had pretty good collaboration and pretty quick responses from ourselves, Airbus, FAA, EASA, Civil Aviation Authority, um, but it but it definitely showed that we were not prepared for this. So we're working hard. I'm I'm sure that Stefan will uh, illustrate that they're doing the same thing to try and come up with some solutions that are sort of preemptive, um, you know, so that next time this happens, we'll be better prepared. Um, I, I think the question was, you know, why were we not better prepared? And I think it's just sort of a bandwidth issue. You know, we're trying to find solutions, you know, military solutions or EMS solutions didn't really understand that there was going to be a pandemic that would affect, you know, 153 countries and a gazillion people. Um, so, um, it, yeah, I think there's definitely lessons to be learned. And Stefan, I, I don't know if uh, you have a different take, but 
that's my my experience <laughs> yes and I, I think the next step is really now to to understand the situation um, um, and exchange with our customer with operators what are the the requirement what are the challenges now and and get the specification and again the the, the challenge then from us is also um, that um, I can't remember who it was um, um, a speaker before said it you have different regions you have different missions you have different customers and that I think finally it's not one solution fits all yeah and one of the biggest challenges for me uh, has been the fact that different regions have those different requirements so you know you based FAA requirements and EMS requirements are different than Europe which is different than Asia uh, different than Africa and so um, it's constantly evolving and uh, I, I think this sort of collaboration that we're doing today is is a perfect example of how we're going to improve all of our systems. Right thank you. Uh, the next um, question was aimed at Sam but I, I'd like to um, point it at um, Stefan as well. Do you have, have um, 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 recommended and approved um, decontamination um, products and if so um, where can, can you, your clients find out, out about them? Um, yeah, Stefan would, would uh, like to go first? Yeah um, what, what I said we have our recommended and, and, and also um, tested um, disinfectants listed in this information notice we distributed. So if, if of our op operators go to the TechPub um, homepage of Airbus Helicopters, uh, they can find the information notice. Um, I can find out the number, but there is this information notice concerning disinfection and there's the whole list. Right, and Sam? We have the same thing. So I'm happy to, if you have others that want to directly i'm happy to forward that but that should have been sent out to all operators right thank you uh there's a question here in fact it's for the o oems but I i'd like to uh, point it towards the operators first of all and the question is do you see a need for a cockpit and um, um cabin um, um barrier as not option to be in, in um, incorporated in, into future builds and designs. David, do you think that would be a help for the future? Um, yeah, Mark, I think that's an excellent question and it fits right in what I said earlier on about being two steps ahead. And um, we've mm. plenty of plans um, down the road when this settles down and looking at things like that. I think that's, yeah, absolutely. That's what we've got to, you know, as one of the one of the presenters said, you know, we've had, you know, an outbreak of some sort every five years, you know, and I think because of that, we, we had, you know, certain infection control procedures and policies and equipment already in place. But certainly, if you're, you know, you've got to have a blank canvas when you're looking at this again in terms of being, you know, um, you know, manufacturers producing stuff, you know, quick, you know, quick seals or something like that that you could use on and off very quickly. I like the Bristol's mod with the um, the, co the the cockpit and um, barrier. Absolutely, it's definitely, you know, you know, it was. It's only when I realised, you know, it's every five years this is happening. We certainly have to plan for this, you know, on a continuous basis. Right. Thank you, and John. Yeah, I can. Uh... This is something we're used to using because we fly on NVG most of the time. So we have to isolate the cockpit from the cabin due to light and stuff like that. So, but uh, a good good solution there that's quickly removable and uh, and, and uh, is something that needs to be there. I need to be able to choose that. Any, any further points at all, Clark? Yeah, none of these solutions is perfect, Mark. Uh, none of the barriers is airtight. Uh, it really we rely on um, ventilation and causing positive pressure in the cockpit. It seems to work for COVID-19. It, yeah, it may not work for for other viruses that we may be faced with in the future. Hmm. Right. Okay. Thank you. And uh, the OEMs. Any thoughts? Thoughts at all? I, I suppose uh, for you, it's simpler to do on on a large type. Well, see, if you, you've um, got a light twin, it's very, very hard to um, seal off the um, cockpit from the cabin. 
Yeah, and the, the question is also, um, yeah, what really the customer require or the need um, as, as um, this situation is really an exception and in the future, I mean, you can do, you can theoretically, you can do a fully isolated aircraft um, with isolated ventilation, air conditioning system, but um, it's currently not existing, but this would mean it's a very heavy, very um, um, complex aircraft, it's a new design. And is the market, uh, does the market want this? So these are the aspects we need, really need to um, um, figure out now with our customers. Mm -hmm. What is midterm and long-term required? And I think for the, for the time being, this is more the, we did the quick win solution and there is something, it's not black and white, I would so say. You don't have only the golden solution, but then you have also improved uh, cabin cockpit separations um, um, not using the foils, but improve to, to make it more tight um, for easy cleaning and so on. This is something, there are different aspects we can look in. All right, thank you. The yeah, next question I would say is for uh, Andy Dutch, and it's have, have you, you done um, testing with um, composites which include um, um, polyethylene? Um, no, we haven't speci we haven't specifically um, tested on polyethylene. Um, we the material the polymers that we've tested are um, acrylics and uh, polycarbonates. All right, thank you. Looking down the list of questions here. Ah, oh, yes, there's another one for uh, Elizabeth. What uh, adaptions have you, you had, had to do to update your comms um, systems to, to interface with um, working um, with the um, civil world? Our routine comms were reasonably robust, but Airwave has been one of the communications equipment that we've added. And then for additional situation awareness, I, I mentioned just a moment ago, the ACAN solution. Um, mm. And both of those solutions together have provided with us with effective interoperability. Right, okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. so looking down the list of questions. So I think we, we've uh, covered most of the um, questions there. And any more to come in, do you think? Perhaps a comment back on the on the cockpit separation. Yes. Um, there was this question, is it should have been the standard? Of course, I think the optimum design is when we are modular, because in under normal situation, um, I think the best is if you can best communicate within the crew, open space is um, is the best solution. Whereas under COVID-19, you want to have the protection. So I think the final solution is being modular and adapt to the different missions, your helicopter. Yeah, and, and I would agree with that, Stefan. I think that's, you know, I think David pointed out that, you know, throwing money at the at the problem, um, although as OEMs love money us, but you know, it's really easy to get caught up in this and say, this is something that everyone has to address, but then tomorrow there's gonna to be a different challenge. So the reason the cockpits were opened was for CRM purposes. And now, you know, due to this pandemic, we wanna isolate them. So I, I think modularity is exactly, you know, the answer that, you know, we should be uh, assuming as OEMs and then operators should be working on in terms of policies and procedures in terms of being adaptable. I think there was a number of slides about being, you know, able to uh, absorb whatever the situation was. Um, and I think this sort of collaboration is is a perfect example of that. I'd just add in there, you have to be able to balance the risk. We, we have open cockpits into the cabin to help with egress in an emergency situation. And if we yeah. put a permanent curtain in place or a barrier in place, we have to be able to balance that risk against the yeah. almost more likely risk that actually we need to be able to egress. Yeah, just, just on that, Mark, um, I, I, you know, I was reading an article only the other day about you know, how, how this will change the future of designing hospitals. That hospitals been 10 years ago are actually nearly out of date for a pandemic like this. 
However, you know, as the rest of the guests just mentioned, you know, you have to have an element of practicality about this and, and sensibility. I mean, in terms of egress and in terms of, you know, CRM. But I, I think for OEMs, I mean, just to, to, to plan in the future for, for, for options, you know, so retrofix, you know, I, I don't think we need to fly with a barrier, you know, uh, every day for the rest of my life. However, it'd be nice to have a quick solution to retro uh, um, and fix or have something planned that in the event of you have options. Look, you know, you're never going to fully contain something like this, you know, so you just got to minim minimize the risks and the more barriers or preventive measures you have in place. And in terms of, you know, working with the OEMs to find solutions, I think that's the, certainly the, 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 the way we need to plan for the future. Um, and again, you know, you can't just seal it up. I mean, you know, you can't just close the hangar doors and go home. If, if You know, there is always going to be an element of risk. I think it's minimizing it and having options when, when the risk. And, you know, the next pandemic could be completely different or the next challenge could be completely different. But just having options, you know, because I think certainly some of the things we've learned here now could have actually been implemented for, you know, the previous issues that have arised. And, you know, it's been, a you know, I don't, I risk saying it's been a great learning experience. It's been a huge challenge. But, I mean, you know, it's, it's been huge changes, certainly in our operation um, um, since this uh, arrived at our uh, doorstep in February. Mm. Yes, because I, I think um, one of the points I, I've got from uh, this is that um, there is there is no best um, um, solution. It all depends upon, upon your um, type of type of operation. And from the very very start, you you might think that the Epi Shuttle will be the best um, version because you contain the patient, you contain uh the the disease in in one point but of course you've got ha handling it issues and if the patient is, is really sick and you've got to to intervene then you, you've got to as john said just pull off the top and and then you, you're all exposed so um really as elizabeth said you've just got, got to risk and um, manage this and, and come up with the least worst um uh, outcome that um, you um, you can perhaps achieve. Right, I think we we I would actually sorry. I would also that you know this is sort of my medical side of the thing. You can't just buy it and say that you have the capacity. The people have to be trained, and so there's a, a whole set of logistics that actually goes along with using that device, which requires kind of constant competency you know based training so um you know as elizabeth said this is a risk you know judgment on each organization to decide you know based on their volume based on what the propensity is to experience those things um but you can't just you know buy an epi shuttle and say oh i'm i'm good um you know or buy some n95 masks and say everything will be fine i think it's it it's a the whole gamut as, as you know, every single presenter here is articulated. Yeah, yeah, right. I I think think time is uh, drawing uh, to a close. So um, first, I'd like to uh, thank everybody who who joined the call. We still seem to have, have 128 online, although it's dropped slightly throughout um, this. And I, I'd like to thank the. Um, speakers and, and especially for being so uh, open and frank um, with the issues you've faced and with that uh, I'll just um, remind you all that the um, um, webinar will uh, be out in, in a few days time it's free to um, download and it's free to share so um, thank you all for um, joining us and uh, wish you all the best in, in these difficult times thank you very much